Workforce planning, human resource planning, the process of anticipating the current and future demand for workers in an organisation. Now this is going to require businesses to be prepared for supply changes in the labour market. Now planning the human resource needs of an organisation requires consideration of the firm's level of demand for labour. Simply put, how much labour does a firm need now? How much does it anticipate that it will need in the near and medium term future? Anticipating the demand for workers. Several factors can be looked at. Firstly, historical data. Changes in staffing allows a business to identify trends. For example, if workers stay on average with the company for five and a half years, then the human resource department can plan around that sort of figure. The more information the business has about its previous um, employment history, the better able it is to plan its rec recruitment needs as it can anticipate the likely number of new recruits that are required. But past data is not always indicative of what will actually happen in the future. Flexibility and workload of employees will provide information on whether to either raise or reduce the demand for human resources. If we have a highly flexible workforce, we may be able to cope if there's sudden change to staffing, a sudden increase in demand, perhaps a sudden decrease in demand. In a firm where people are over-specialised and the workload is soaring, it may be necessary to employ more workers. A highly specialised workers are not going to be able to fill in for another specialised worker that's just left the company. The skills and expertise of existing workers may mean that they need can be reassigned to different jobs if they're flexible enough and when necessary. Demand for a certain type of worker increases, perhaps some workers can be shifted there if there's enough flexibility in their training and their skill level. Um, a restructuring of human resources such as management opting for a smaller hierarchical structure. We're going to come to that later. That's in Unit 2.2. will also affect the demand for labour. Capital intensity. Uh, the, the opposite of labour intensity, really. It measures the amount of capital usage in comparison to other factors of production. An automated business such as a car manufacturing plant, think Toyota, Huge investment in capital equipment, robots replacing workers. Any change to automate, automation will result in a business requiring less labour. So you could imagine Toyota back in the old days when they had workers instead of those robots. They were screwing in the bolts, assembling panels. Along came the robots, displaced the workers. A low capital intensity, this is the opposite. Low capital intensity means high labour intensity. There's a lot of labour compared to the capital machinery involved. It's going to require the business to hire more workers if output is going to be raised. So, for example, if waiting lists for a National Health Service are to be reduced, it's likely to require the recruitment of more doctors and nurses. Work study is a scientific management tool. It's aimed at measuring the best way to complete certain processes. So if we can have a look at the jobs that are required to be done and break them down to who does what and who does what when, then the most efficient path to completion of that job can be identified and used to increase productivity. Increase productivity, you can perhaps reduce your labour. Derived demand, coming straight from economics, the level of demand for labour, like all other resources, depends on the final demand for the good or service, the product that's being produced. So if there's no need for a school to hire German language teachers, if students don't opt to take the subject. Derived demand, German language teacher, out the door. 
increased student demand for business and management. More business and management teachers walking in the door. Derived demand. What's demanded needs to be supplied. Who can supply it? Those with the skills. The Human Resource Department is going to have to analyze jobs. Before rec recruiting new workers, they're going to need to assess the routine tasks and responsibilities that the job requires. What is it that needs to be done? Who are they responsible for? Who are they responsible to? What skills and training are needed for them to be able to do that job? Qualifications and personal attributes. Are there specific qualifications that are required to enable a person to do the job? Is there a specific personal characteristic that the job requires? Customer service. You obviously need to be bubbly, happy, smiley, helpful. One of those people that like to help people. These are the sort of personal attributes human resource management will be looking at when fulfilling their customer service related recruitment needs. They're also going to have to look at the rewards needed to recruit for the position. Now this is namely the salary or wage rate. If they pitch the wage rate too low, they're going to have trouble staffing that position. There may be other benefits that are required. Recruitment and selection, essential to the running of any business. Remember that labour is one of those four factors of production necessary for the provision of any good or services. Now hiring the right person, hiring the right people helps ensure that the business can function effectively. Now it's quite a time consuming job and it can be rather expensive. It's crucial that managers ensure the procedures in place for recruiting the people that the business needs is as effective as possible. Now recruitment often begins when the vacancy becomes available within the organization. Someone, uh, the business has expanded or somebody is left and it's necessary to replace that person. The first thing they're going to have to do in advertising for the new job is to come up with a job description. Now that's a document that outlines the nature of a job. So the roles, the tasks and responsibilities. It's used not only for the recruitment of a person for the job, but also for a performance appraisal of employees. Once there's a job description, you can match how well the new employee is fulfilling his or her new job. Next we have the person specification. This is a business document that gives a profile of the ideal candidate for a job, their skills, their qualifications, experience and other personal attributes. Your turn. Why is it necessary for a business to produce well-defined job descriptions? We're specifically looking at you incorporating these words into this paragraph. Attract the right, inappropriate candidates, what job entails, sifting through applications, people applying, costs, potential applicants, time spent, Conflict about, answering questions, time spent, prevent too many. Okay, a quick summary of the recruitment process. As we speak, a list of activities that the human resource managers are required to do are popping up. Your job 
in a second. It's to list these in chronological order, in time order, from first to last. So the human resource management role, you need to list these activities in chronological order. It's probably a good time to pause the video now, come back and check your answers in a second. Right, first things first, perform job analysis to determine the firm's need to hire. Write that job description and person specification. Using these, we'll advertise the post. Once we've got applications coming in, we'll screen them and come up with a short list of those most suitable to the position. We'll interview those on the shortlist. The longer your shortlist, the more costly it is for your business. We may or may not test the aptitude of the candidates. Whether it's appropriate or not, it's um, an issue that the Human Resource Department is going to have to work through. Check references. Come up with a job offer, cross your fingers, hope your ideal candidate is willing to sign the contract of employment. And then we'll begin the induction and training program for the new recruit. Summary of the recruitment process. Job interviews. How would I describe myself? Three words. Hardworking, alpha male, jackhammer, merciless, insatiable. <laughs> right, what not to do at a job interview. Interviews are all about getting a better idea of what the applicant is like, isn't it? Well, not really. Interviews are not actually that good at predicting how well someone is going to be at doing their job. Not only are interviews time consuming for everybody involved, but they're not necessarily the best way of finding the right person. To better improve the chances, the likelihood, the success of the interview, finding the right candidate, interviews must be structured with their content. The same candidate, different candidates must be being asked the same questions. Their responses should be recorded so they can be reviewed at a later time. Each candidate can be compared with the same question have a look at their answers, compare them against all the other candidates. And we call that an evaluation structure. So a checklist of things that should be asked, explained, gone into, discussed. Questions in the interview can be behavior based. These are good. I explained an example of when you led a team successfully to complete a difficult job. And they can be situational based. For example, if one of your team members was consistently late for work, what would you do? These type of questions are some of the most commonly asked. The costs of getting it wrong are large. The interview process is a costly, time-consuming process. Get it wrong, six months down the track, you'll be going through the same process again. Human resource managers will be involved, senior managers will be involved, department heads will be involved, time-consuming. Not only that, loss of productivity as well, getting the wrong candidate in.